<laughs> this is the worst. <laughs> There's our leader. Okay. <laughs> our fearless well, leader. Well, y'all are going to have to teach the lesson today because I could not get on. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, technology is a blessing and a curse. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Um, yeah. You know. <laughs> <You're curious. laughs> I'm glad to have y'all here. I'm glad I got on. Okay. There you are. You, yeah. You see me? I see you. Yes. Okay, good. Can you hear me? Last week you yes. didn't hear me. I threw my watch off. You loud and clear. Yes. I threw my watch is off this time. I figured that out. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. We've already lost five minutes. Because... <laughs> okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I thank you, Lord, so much for your um your wisdom. And our Lord, I thank you that you are in control, not technology and not people, but we can count on your faithfulness, Lord. And I pray that as we look at these scriptures, that we will be faithful to it and we will be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, here we go. Um, we're starting, um, you know, we've been doing this study. And this is about how to be happy. It's a book about how to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if someone was going to write a self-help book that says how to be happy, you got to be poor in spirit, you have to mourn, and you have to be meek. I don't think it's going to sell very well. <laughs> I don't think it's going to do it. But God's word is more important than selling books, right? Yeah. Amen. So... Blessed are the meek that will that shall inherit the earth. This is a two part two part thing. Um, we're gonna we're gonna study sovereignty tonight, which is hard. Sovereignty understanding sovereignty is hard in in hard. some areas. It, it's just hard to understand. But we're gonna find out what God's word says about it. And then next week, we're going to learn more about how to live that out. So she does it in two, two sections. Because if you don't understand sovereignty, you can't get the meekness part. And so that's why she does it. So, and, and you'll, we'll figure that out as we go through it. So, again, blessed are the meek. You shall inherit the earth. These are shocking statements to the audience. The audience has never heard these kind of things before. They um, heard Jesus say absolute foreign things to their thinking because they knew how how to be spiritually proud. They knew they knew about religion. They were they were in really good form with the Lord. They thought they were in the in group with God and they thought they could survive on their own strength and their own wisdom, their own might and their own resources. And so they expected the Messiah to show up and say, I'm here to commend you for your great religiosity. I'm here to commend you for your wonderful spirituality. I am here to announce that God has looked down from heaven and is very pleased with you. <laughs> This is what they actually expected. And when um, Jesus starts off with blessed are those of poor in spirit, those who mourn. This was something that they had never heard before. They're, um, so blessed are those who are broken in spirit, sinners on my sinfulness. And they didn't think that they were that sinful. Mourning focuses on our, not only on our sins, but sins of the church and sins of the world. And they really weren't concerned about those sins. And the meekness here centers on God's holiness and God's sovereignty before you can understand meekness. And so this is why Kay starts off with sovereignty. So let's go to um, page 77 in your book. It says... <clears throat> These are um, these are by no means natural qualities. Poor in spirit doesn't come naturally to us. Mourning over sin doesn't come naturally. Meekness doesn't come naturally. 
He says, where, she says, where then do these supernatural traits come from? They were woven in and through the fabric of our character on the loom of God's indwelling Holy Spirit. He makes our lives a tapestry that portrays the image of the living God. So these do not come natural. Um, lost people have a hard time doing this. They can, they can look good on the outside by doing it, but it isn't what is going to give them in, inheritance of the kingdom. And these are characteristics of what it looks like to be in the kingdom. Look at page 78. In the middle of the page there, it says, Meekness seeks, speaks of a submissive and trusting attitude toward God. It is an attitude which, which accepts all of God's ways with us as good. It does not murmur or dispute. It neither rebels or retaliates. It realizes that what comes to us from the hand of God has been permitted by God's sovereignty and has been filtered by his hands of love and will be used by God for his glory and our ultimate good. Whether it's good or bad, we like to think God is sovereign in all the good things, but he's not sovereign in all the bad things. That's the devil, right? So this is why we're looking at God's sovereignty. Let's look at Daniel 4. Nebuchadnezzar that we studied in when we studied Daniel. Of course, this uh, Nebuchadnezzar thought, um, you know, this is my kingdom. This is my kingdom that I have made and I am sovereign over it all. And before he finished speaking, God turned him into this animal an animal that had hair like eagle's feathers and nails like bird's claws. He ate from the grass of the field. He was an animal for seven years. He was this way. And God says, until you come to your reasoning, that's what's going to happen. Well, at the end of seven years, and God had predicted, he, he prophesied this through Daniel, that seven years you're going to be living like an animal. And here Nebuchadnezzar could say, I don't like what God did to me. I don't like, I didn't like living like an animal. And I am going to be angry with God and I'm going to do everything I can to thwart him. But Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, and I believe that he may be in heaven because of his repentant attitude here in Daniel 4. Mm -hmm. Daniel 4, verse 34 and 35. But at the end of that period, which was seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the mm -hmm. most high and praised and honor him who lives forever. That's a repentant heart. He says, for his dominion is forever, is an everlasting dominion, which means it can't be overtaken by Satan or any person, right? His kingdom endures from generation to generation. It's not like kings who their sons inherit and their sons, their uncles. No, God's kingdom endures for generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Compared to God, no one is important. Uh, but he does according to his will with, with the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. The host of heaven is like he explained, is good and bad angels. He does what he wants according to his will with both good and bad angels. And we know that from Job 1. Mm -hmm. God only allows Satan to go so far. And he had to ask permission to do that. So his will is not thwarted by Satan. His will is not thwarted by people. No one can ward off his hand or say to him, what has thou done? You know, we ask God, we, we question God. Why did you do this? Why did you allow me to go through this? And we're going to look at Romans 9. Romans 9, starting in verse 14.
Okay, we see the sovereignty of God here in Romans 9, like nothing else. Verse 14. Let me see if I have the right version. I don't. Hold on. It's hard for me to read that on there. Um, verse 14. What shall we say then? Okay. Is there no injustice with there is no injustice with God, is there? Far from it. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy, and I will show compassion to whoever I show compassion. So then it does not depend on the person who wants it or the one who, ru who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this ver very reason, I raised you up in order to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. Get that. He hardens whom he desires. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? That's a good question. For who can resist his will? That's a good question. On the contrary, who are you, you foolish person, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Do, or does the potter not have the right over the clay to make the same lump one object for honorable use and another for common use? through 24, right? <clears throat> what if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with great patience objects of wrath prepared for destruction, and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon objects of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, namely us, whom he also called, not only from among Jews, but also from among the Gentiles. This is God's sovereignty. He can do what he wants with what he has created. And we can't say, what are you doing? Or why? God has the right to do whatever he wants with whomever he created. Okay. And we're going to see that as we see some more of these verses. But Roman 9 really explains it very, very well. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at page 80. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Mm -hmm. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts are my thoughts than your thoughts. Psalm 50, um, in the Psalm 5, number 50, it says, you thought I was just like you. We are not like God. We cannot understand God. We cannot understand everything that he does because we're not like him. He's not like us. His thoughts are higher than us. His ways are higher than us. There is a song on um, Z88 that I like. I can't remember the name of it, but it says um, something about um, this doesn't feel good right now, but I know that you're God and I am not. Yeah. And, um. So we have to remind ourselves that we are not God. We may not like some of the things that God does, but we are not God. Okay. In that um, paragraph after on 81, after the scripture, it says, faith steps into the picture at this point because we are finite human beings with limited understanding. We must not try to force God's truth to fit into our pattern of thinking. Okay. We must simply accept what he says, whether we understand it or not, what he has revealed is more than enough to teach us how to live. Okay. So we, just because we don't like what's happening to us, we don't change scripture. 
We don't change God and who he is. Okay, But what we can do is live by how he has revealed himself to us. And this is where beyond that we must say with Paul in Romans 11, Paul says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of God or who became his counselor? In other words, who's given advice to God? You want to give advice to God? I don't think so. Or, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? This is saying God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe you even another day. He doesn't owe you anything. He's not in debt to you. For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever. God is the source. He's the sustainer. He's the rightful end of everything that exists. And we have no right to question him. The... um. The last paragraph says, once we understand and accept the fact that God's sovereignty leaves our free will intact, we must admit accountability to him for our actions. Now, um, the free will that is intact there actually only comes after salvation. Okay. God is sovereign, but yet he still holds us accountable. And look at, <clears throat> I want to look at uh, John 6. <clears throat> we actually have a free will to sin, but we do not have a, as we look at these verses on sovereignty, you're going to understand that it is God's will that saves us, not ours, okay? John 6, 26 to, um, see where I did it. 39. 39, okay. And then 44. Right, and then 44. Okay, let's look at that. 26. Now, this is interesting. Now, I included a lot of background here for where I wanted to get because I wanted to get to um, verse 44. But I wanted you to read the background to this because this is very interesting. It says, Jesus answered them. Now, this is just after uh, Jesus fed the 5,000. He fed them bread and fish. And they thought that was great. And they really wanted a lot more of that. So they followed him. Okay. And then Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate some of the loaves and were filled. <laughs> he says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the son of man will give you for on him, the father, God has set his seal. Therefore, they said to him, what are we to do so that we can, we can accomplish the works of God? They didn't want the works of God. They wanted free bread. Okay. <laughs> Jesus answered them and said to this, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what then are you doing as a sign so that we may see and believe in you? They wanted more miracles. They've already seen a sign, the feeding of the 5,000. They're, they're, they're just saying, give us some more of this miracle stuff. <clears throat> what work are you performing? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. They're saying, look, our, our father, Moses, they got food every day. They didn't have to work for it. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. This is, again, they're wanting more bread. Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is the Father who gives you the true bread of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives, and gives life to the world. Then they say, Lord, always give us this bread. 
they're still looking for bread. <laughs> and they want it the easy way. That's where they are today. And that, oh, my mom says that's the way people are today. They just want what they can get from God. So they don't have to do all this work. And granted, it was harder for them, uh, you know, for feeding their family. It was harder. And when they saw how easy it was that Jesus could make bread, they just wanted them to keep making it. Just like rain them loaves of bread from heaven. That would be nice. So Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life who comes, who the one who comes to me will not be hungry. The one who believes in me will never thirst. But I say that you have indeed seen me and yet you do not believe. believe. They didn't believe in that. They just wanted an easy life. They wanted his miracles. Everything that the father gives me will come to me, will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out for I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me. This is it. That of everything that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my father, that everyone who sees the son and believes in him will have eternal life. Now look at verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Very important. And I will raise him up on the last day. So here, what we have is, Jesus said, um, nobody's going to come to Christ if they're not drawn by the Father. That's sovereign power. Nobody comes to Christ unless they're given to Christ by the Father. That's divine sovereignty. Jesus says, I do not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And his will is that all that he has been given, that they would come and he would lose none of them. That's divine sovereignty. The Father chooses, the Father draws, the father gives to the son, the son receives, the son keeps, and the son raises. That's divine sovereignty. Any questions or comments so far? Because this is hard. This is hard stuff. It's a little hard to understand. Okay. Where is, the, where is human responsibility? That's what we want to know, right? If no one can be saved unless the Father draws him. That's what the Bible says. No one can be saved. And all that, that the Father draws comes to Christ. Okay? Now, let's look. Oh, any, anybody want to say anything so far? Okay, let's keep looking. Let's keep looking. Acts 2. <clears throat> um, Acts 2. Where am I? To choose. Acts 2, verse 22. Now, this is after Pentecost, and Peter is preaching to Israel. My computer is slow tonight. Okay. Men of Israel. So he's talking to all of Israel here. Listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man, attested to you by God with miracles and wonders. You saw his wonders. You saw his signs, which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourself know, this man, this is important, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Jesus dying on the cross was God's plan. He had, he had planned it from the beginning of the world that he was going to die for the sins of sinners. It was already predetermined. 
So that's easy to understand. I understand that it was God's, God's plan that Jesus died on the cross. Here's the thing. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. There is man's accountability. There is man's responsibility. You're, it was God's plan, but he used sinful men to do it. And they are held accountable for it. But God raised him from the dead and put an end to the agony of death. Okay. So there is God's sovereign plan, but man's accountability, his uh, responsibility. <clears throat> it was God's will. It was God's plan, but you're guilty. Um. Now let's, yeah. Okay, now page 82 in your book. She also mentions Judas. Mm -hmm. um, just after that John 19, 11 scripture there, she says, God knew all along that Judas Iscariot was going to betray Jesus. That was part of his plan. That was how he was going to be betrayed and crucified. Jesus knew it also. God used it to accomplish his plan of redemption, yet Judas was fully accountable before God. God uses lost people. God uses bad th that look, things that look bad. You know, the disciples thought, this is not looking good. Jesus is going to die. But God uses lost people. He uses um, evil people to accomplish his plans. Okay, on page 83, here's the thing, too. What I like what she says in the middle of the page. You know, we often fear what um, that we might be missing out. We understand God's sovereignty, but we're like, well, how do I make the decisions? I don't want to miss out on God's best. What if I take one job and don't take another? What if God wanted me to have this other job? And, and then sometimes we have regrets and or about our mistakes. And we're like, oh, if I had not only not made those mm -hmm. mistakes in my life, things mm -hmm. would have been better. But we have to understand that God uses all of that. He uses our mistakes. He uses um, our decisions. Okay, in the middle of the page, it says thoughts like these of missing out on God's best and, and, mm -hmm. best and regrets about mistakes. Thoughts like these can unleash sheer mental torture. You can mm -hmm. make yourself mad by mm -hmm. thinking of what I should have done or what I could have done. Yes. Live with these thoughts long enough and your mind may become paralyzed, spinning you into a depression and despair. Yet what you may not realize, it, this is a missile from the enemy's arsenal, a destructive mm -hmm. tactic as old as the Garden of Eden. Um Satan in the Garden of Eden wanted Adam and Eve to believe that God was holding out on them, that God didn't have their best interest at heart, and that they needed to do whatever they wanted to do, not what God wanted them to do. And so he, she says, he will try to make you question God's goodness, question God's timing, question God's care and concern for you, question God's control of life's tiny yet momentous details run to the sovereignty of God, beloved rest in his loving control of every particular of your life. You know, we think, well, yeah, I understand that God is in charge of the big things. He's in charge of the big things, but what about the little things? He's in charge of them too. Yes. So, you know, they were on 9-11. There were some people that missed their, their airplane because they did their alarm clock didn't go off. Right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes when you're stuck in traffic, it could be that God is keeping you from an accident further down the mm -hmm. road, right? Yeah. Maybe he uses right. red lights. <laughs> you know? Yes. Have you ever heard the poem of want of a nail? No. For for want of a nail. 
It says, for want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of, a, of the shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the rider was lost. For want of a rider, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for want of a horseshoe nail. Mm. Is, God, is God in charge of the little things? I believe that he is because if you're not in charge of everything, you're not in charge of anything. anything. Right. 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 Okay. Um, so our peace, our peace comes, our meekness comes from knowing that God is sovereign and he is in control. Otherwise, we will be angry. We will be depressed. We will have regrets. Mm -hmm. And that's not how God wants us to live. He wants us to have peace in understanding that he is sovereign. Okay. Any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Yep. For me. Okay. Okay. Um, Isaiah 14. The Lord of armies has sworn, saying, Cer certainly, just as I have intended, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. And then verse 27, for the Lord of armies has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his outstretched arm, who can turn it back? Now, in the middle of page 84, she writes, meekness bows the knee and realizes that everything is permitted and used by God for our chastening. Or our purifying. Meekness says, not my will, but yours be done. Meekness bows before the throne and realizes that God who sits on the throne is all wise God. Um, then uh, where it says, therefore, the second paragraph from the bottom, if you are experiencing neither happiness nor fulfillment in your marriage or any other relationship, you have done all you should, and you have done all you should have in the light of the word, then rest. God will see to it that even your heartbreak will work together for good. So bow your knee and say, I will give thee thanks forever because thou hast done it, and I will wait on thy name for it is good. And that's Psalm 52. Because he is God, he will satisfy your thirsty soul. He will fill your hungry soul with what is good. You know, some people give advice on, you need to just do whatever makes you happy. That's not really good advice for Christians. <laughs> Lost people, maybe, because they don't have any other avenues to find peace in their life. But it's not, it's what we should be saying is do what glorifies God. And that's what she says on page 85 at the last um, sentence of the first paragraph, the Westminster Confession, that the chief aim of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. My, uh, I know you've heard me say this, Micah 6, 8, one of my favorite <laughs> verses. What does the Lord require of you but to do just, to love mercy and to walk humbly? That's what God requires of us. Not that we find our own happiness, but you will find peace in glorifying God. Yes, you will. You will enjoy God forever. You know, we, we focus so much on the happiness on this world, on this earth, but this world, this earth is a very short time compared to what we will live in eternity in, in a wonderful environment. And we will be happy there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, now, um, Deuteronomy, on page 87, Deuteronomy 32 and 29. See, that I, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. Even the disciples said, Lord, where else are we going to go? You're the best thing out there. You're, you're it. You're the only God. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my 
hand. Um, look, Job 14 says that he's, ta he's talking about man and he says, you have numbered his days and you, man cannot pass that number. That means that God has planned your life and in Matthew 6, it says you can't add another day of your life by worrying, can you? Mm -hmm. I truly believe that God has a plan for our life. He has a plan for when all of us are going to die and how all of us are going to live, how long all of us are going to live. And I believe that those verses say that. Look at uh, Revelation 1, 17, 19 there in the book. Do not be afraid, and the first, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Um, Charles Spurgeon says about the keys there. He says, Christ has purchased the bodies as well as the souls of his people. He has redeemed them by blood. Their mortal frames are temples of the Holy Ghost. Rest assured, he will not lose a part of his purchase. I like that. Rest assured, God is not going to lose a part of any part of his purchase. It is not the will of our Father in heaven that the Redeemer should be defrauded of any part of his purchased possession. I really, I like that. Jesus has the keys of death and Hades and he will open it or he will close it to where he wants you to go. Mm. Right? Okay. Okay, any questions? That's good. Okay. Verse um page 88. Um I like what she says. One of the um the first part as we saw yesterday, one of the things that makes it difficult to accept is God's sovereignty is the fact that he apparently permits adversary adversity or evil. And it's true, he does permit evil in our world. And I gave you a link for the Amish story. Oh, yeah. To about read that. Girls. Yes. Yeah. That was about eight years ago in Pennsylvania, where a man uh, boarded up a school with some kids in it, and he shot 10 of them, and, and eight and five of them were killed. And it was the, the reaction of the Amish society. Mm -hmm a community that is really mm -hmm. convicting, isn't it? Convicting. Yeah. Yes. Um, they have the fact yeah. that, that they, um, they knew that it, they, it was like David, David, King David, when his son had died, he, before he died, he was mourning and praying and praying. But after he died, he, he washed his face and said, I, he can't come to me, but I will go to him. And yes, there is a grieving process, but you also have to understand the sovereign God. And you can make that make you angry against God, or you can do, um, you can glorify God in it. You can yeah, say, but... I understand that I can't bring my child back, but I will see my child again, because that's what's the most important, living in heaven, not living here on earth. And their reaction was that they, that same day their children were killed, they went to the widow and the parents of the murder and said, we forgive yeah. you. Yeah. It's unbelievable, yeah. the reaction. Unbelievable. And that's meekness. It is anger under control. It is understanding God's sovereignty and giving God the glory, even when it hurts so terribly like that we still have to honor god and glorify god that would be that would be you know and god will give people grace you can't say i could never do that 
God gives you grace when it's time to give you grace, mm -hmm. you know. So trying to figure out the exact reasons for something is sometimes hard to understand. But what we can, we can't, we may not can understand God's reasoning, but we can understand that God is sovereign and we have to trust. We have to trust that. And a lot of times it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable to things that happen. And we want to know why. We want to know why, God, are you doing this? But you also understand that God isn't just working in your life. He's working in people who are related to you, who are neighbors to you, or working with you. And these people are watching you go through your trials. Mm -hmm. And you also may be able to comfort someone else who is going through these kind of things later in your life. But what you don't say is say, mm -hmm. you need to go um, just... Uh, go find a, you know, a worldly wisdom to get you out of your depression or your despair or your whatever you need to, but we need to do is uh, point people to God. We need to point people to a sovereign God. And that's where they will find peace. That's it. So Isaiah 45, five through seven. I am the Lord, there is no other besides me, there is no God. From the rising to the setting of the sun, there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other, the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. Now, this is not creating evil, but he's talking about wars, the opposite of peace, troubling times, okay? I am the Lord who does all these things. Now, it's very hard to understand that if God doesn't create evil, but he uses evil for his plan. That's where you say, I don't understand it, but I know that God says it. Okay. Ecclesiastes 7, 13 to 14. Consider the works of God. Who is able to straighten what he has bent? <laughs> In the day of prosperity, be happy. But in the day of adversity, adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. God has made the good days and he's made the bad days. But so that man may not discover anything that will be after him. Um, God has created a range of experiences that... Some are good and, and some are, are bad, but they're but with, they are all there for us to learn, for learn from them. In the middle on page 89, in the middle it says, um, this is the way it is with many of us. We are so focused on the future that we can't understand the things happening to us now. Our circumstances seem confusing and don't appear to be taking us in the direction we want to go. Our immediate relationships and situations seem strangely out of focus and confused. We struggle and strain to see things more clearly. This is why some people have problems with the sovereignty of God. They look into the future. In the middle of that paragraph, they have difficulty accepting and handling hurts and setbacks and adversities in daily life. Life seems out of control. How could these bumps and bruises possibly be coming from God? And, you know, again, we he is God and we are not. There are times when when I have questioned, God, why, why, why are you hindering me from going this direction? I want to go this direction and I want to do it to help you out. <laughs> and then there's times where I said, I don't want to go that direction. I don't see any good coming out of that direction, but it's easier now that I can look back and see, you know what? I can see God's hand in how he led me where I am today, where I didn't want to go. I never, never wanted to live in Christmas ever. <laughs> I know now looking back, I can see where God was leading us and how God has, has, um, this was part of God's plan. Mm -hmm. I can see that it's easier to do, 2020 hindsight's 2020 right but sometimes he doesn't give you that 
that he doesn't give you why he's doing something. So we just have to trust him. We have to trust him for our future. Okay, so um, the end of the paragraph on that page, meekness then when faced with adversity, bows the knee. Meekness acknowledges that God is eternal. It says with David, but as for me, I trust in thee, O Lord. I say, thou art my God. My times are in thy hands. Right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, Ver uh, page 91. Those who want everything set down in some logical five-step presentation, complete with graphs <laughs> and pie charts, are always going to struggle with these divine mysteries. This is where meekness and faith come in. Faith says, God, I don't understand, but I know you are sovereign, loving, and just. I may never understand in this life, but I will not accuse you. I will not slander you or alter a single word of your words to fit my poor, limited perspective. And this is very important. We have a, there's a phrase that's called situational ethics. We know what God says, but I know what I've experienced, and I think I know more than God. Mm. Okay? We allow our situation or our experience to govern what we believe about God. And we can only see a little part of this whole, of my whole life. But then we're judging God on what our experiences are and not on what God's word says. So be very careful that you don't um, get your theology by what something your aunt did or his cousin did or something that happened in your life. We have to stick to what the God, what God's word says. Oh, and then Deuteronomy 32, three and four, Moses <laughs> Moses is a great example. He so he put up with these complainers and and moaners for 40 <laughs> years. He was in the king's palace living the good life. And God sent him to the desert to lead these these rebels for 40 years and he made a mistake. He struck a rock instead of speaking to it and God says you are not going to enter into the promised land and Moses could say well forget you God I did all this for you and this is what I get but he didn't he would he didn't get angry with God he says in Deuteronomy 32 for I proclaim the name of the Lord ascribe greatness to our God the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are just a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. That was his attitude. And we might say, well, that's not fair that God didn't let Moses go into the, uh, the promised land. Well, what happened when they went into the promised land? They had wars. People died. I mean, it, and it could be that God was saving him from all of that. We look at the promises here on earth. And God says, sometimes I just want to save you from what's on this earth. And I want to take you home. Mm -hmm. Moses wasn't angry with God for that. He blessed God. Okay. Page 98. Let's skip on over. I know you've already read some of these um, illustrations that she gives. But here's the thing. On page 98. I like what she says here. The first paragraph, he says, if man is in control, if we don't want to believe that God is sovereign, let's think of some other scenarios. If man is in control, then he would have to be as great and powerful as God himself. He would have to be capable of usurping the will of God and doing whatever he wants. Would you accept a teaching like this? No. If Satan is in control, then he could do whatever he wishes without God's permission. 
He can harm whoever he wants, meddle in any and all of God's plan. If this were so, then Satan is as powerful as God. Could that be? Could a created being actually set his throne above the creator? No. He tried. And he himself, he found himself condemned to the lake of fire. But then, if neither man nor the devil is in control, then we are in hands of fate. And if that's true, then some power or force, whatever it be, is determining our destiny rather than God. God is not transcendent. He is not above his creation, if this is the tr the case. His creation would have been usurped from, from his sovereign throne by that which he brought into being, such as created Satan. We can't trust that we're just hoping that it works out. We can't trust that faith is in charge of our life. We can't trust that Satan is in control. He wants to destroy God's creation. Mm -hmm. We can't say that we as man are in control. We mess up our lives every day. We're not doing a great job. Then he, she says, and reason with me, if God is not sovereign, how can he tell us then and everything give thanks for this is God's will for you. I have to remind me of that often when, when I'm not liking what's happening in my life or in my day. Thank God. Give thanks in everything because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And then in um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, he then promises that all things work together for good. It doesn't say for your good. It says for good. Right? Mm -hmm. The best thing that's going to happen to us is we get to go to heaven. And mm. the fact the best thing that happens to us is that everything that happens to us is within the hands of a sovereign God. And I remember having two boys at the same time deployed. One was in Iraq and one was in Afghanistan. And I thought to myself, Lord, if they die in this war, that is your will. That is God's will if one of them gets killed. And I can't imagine being a mother of a military soldier and not resting in the promise that nothing is going to happen to my sons outside of God's yeah. protection, his will, outside of God's will, okay? Whether they live or die, that's going to be God's will. And that's what we rest in. We rest in that because this world, this life is not the end all. <clears throat> Then she says, um, the second paragraph up from the bottom of that page, this is what it's all about right here. Meekness rests in childlike trust in the Lord and says, my Lord and my God, if it pleases you, it pleases me. I like that. And then, of course, in Psalm 131, David, David, who had sinned greatly, and David had a man murdered. He says this, O oh Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters. He says, I'm not in charge of this world. You are. Or in the difficult, or in things too difficult for me. I may not understand it all. Surely I am, I have composed and quieted my soul this is where he has peace he has peace in that he's not in control he has peace that god is in control like a weaned child rest against his mother my soul is like a weaned child within me i have a peace i am comforted oh israel hope in the lord from this time forth and forever and david later on he he lost three sons that was God's will for David. You know, he lost three sons. He knew what it was like to lose children. Um, I 
And Jesus is our prime example of meekness. And we're going to study this meekness a little more on how it's lived out next week. <clears throat> but in Matthew 21, it talks about Jesus coming into Jerusalem before they killed him. And he says, behold, the king cometh unto the meek, meek, sitting on an ass and a colt and a fault of an ass. So Jesus comes to the city. He didn't come on a white stallion to conquer. He came riding a coal, a, a, the foal of a jackass. That is really low class transportation. Okay. He was meek. He came in gentleness and, and mildness, subdued character. But that's not weakness. It's not weakness. It's power under control is what meekness is. It's trusting God's plan. So there were times when Jesus got angry, right? But me but meekness says, I have no defense for me, but I'm going to I'm going to give my life. I'll die for God for what is right with God. It's not a passive acceptance of sin. But here's real here's real uh meekness in 2 Peter 2. It says neither was guile found in his mouth. He never did anything wrong. Neither did. So whatever anybody accused him of was false accusations. And he could have gotten angry. So whatever anyone punished him for was wrong. Him being crucified on the cross by the world was wrong. But he didn't say anything. He didn't even defend himself. Whenever they mocked him, it was, it was a lie, but he didn't say, ah, uh, that's not true. He just knew this is important. It says, when he was reviled, he didn't revile again. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He committed himself to him who judges rightly. Jesus knew that this was the will of God. Whatever was happening to him was God's will and that God would do the judging. We don't have to do the judging. God did the judging, and that's meekness. It was God's plan that Jesus die, and Jesus was willing to suffer it for it. Whatever pleased God pleased Jesus. Okay, any questions, comments, complaints? <laughs> I just like how she had you write out, you know, different things in the back about you know, what you observed from God, it really made me think about the different oh, yeah. aspects of God on how faithful he is and just from the different scriptures and stuff. And so now when yeah. you look at scriptures, you automatically think about this makes you open up to a different, a different, you know, when you read it, you're thinking more about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit or whatever, you know, about how he is. In each right. verse, I know that's what I got out of that. That's just been, that was just really, really well, powerful was, to me. Right. Yeah, that was really good. That was a lot of work because there was a lot of scriptures there and a lot about God. But I, it reminds me of the picture that I saw when the hurricane came was mm -hmm. that it showed Jesus in the storm. And it mm -hmm. says, focus on me, not on the Yeah. And I thought that was very good. There was a, um, did you get that picture, Danielle, of, uh, or the uh, saying that I had with the picture? <laughs> Not the picture. There you go. It, I saw this today on Facebook, and I thought, this is so good. If you think you've blown God's plan for your life, rest <laughs> in this. You, my be beautiful friend, are not that powerful. <laughs> you are not That's that good. powerful. That's that, was, that was pretty good I like that, that I saw. Yeah. That's good. Now, that and, and um, we, this is a very hard doctrine to grab, to just wrap your head around. It really is hard to understand all the things that happen with us is part of God's plan. And a lot of times we don't like it. Damn. We don't like it, but we have to focus on God and not on the storm. We have to realize that he is God and we are not. All right. 
Yeah. Okay. Anybody yeah. else? Okay. All right, then uh, next week we'll also be on meekness. So continue our study on this book on how to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> How to be happy, how to have peace. I think that's more the title, how to have peace. How to have peace. Okay. Thank you, ladies, for coming. Thank you, Pam. And doing all the work. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.